had apparently been photocopied from an unrelated letter that Truman wrote to Vannevar Bush back, uh, uh, written in the uh, 1st of October of 1947. So you get the impression this thing was just a hoax. There are other anomalies that were noted and published in various media, so it w quickly within the UFO community in uh, just a few years it was recognized by everyone that these documents were just fakes. And so most people either never heard of MG-12 or they quote know, close quote, that it was just a, a very elaborate hoax. Until Friedman comes along. Stanton Friedman, he was a nuclear physicist. He spent over a decade painstakingly probing 15 libraries and archives. And he now has cast significant doubts about the doubters. He has refuted most of the documentation quibbles that were raised by the skeptics, but more importantly, he compiled detailed dossiers on each of the 12, and he's made some intriguing discoveries. See, by collecting the details on each one, some very interesting corroborations have emerged. And these are all published in his book, uh, Top Secret Magic, uh, in 1996. Let's take Gen General Nathan Twining as an example. He had been scheduled to fly to Seattle on July 16th of 1947 to review the new B-50 bomber that was being built by Boeing at that time, and also to do some fishing with some old friends. So that was all scheduled for some time. Suddenly, General Twining canceled his Seattle trip and headed for New Mexico on July 7th. This is billed as just a routine inspection, but that doesn't jibe with the apparent urgency to upset all these other long laid plans for no apparent uh, specific reason. It's also interesting that on July 9th, President Truman met with New Mexico Senator Chavez um, uh, with no reason given. So you get the feeling behind these calendar entries there's something going on. Another interesting guy is Donald Menzel. He apparently, Friedman discovers, had a, led a double life. As a UFO debunker and a distinguished astronomer in public, he was a well-known astronomer. He also ran around poking holes at these UFO conjectures that were going on in those days. But it turns out he was also a linguist, a cryptographer, and a consultant to the National Security Agency and the Defense Intelligence Agency for more than 30 years, and this was not known in the public. This is something Stanton found out by doing his homework. He held a top secret ultra clearance, and none of this was known to the general public. So it's interesting, whoever contrived this hoax had a lot of inside information somehow. Now what's also provocative is Dr. Menzel, he gave some technical explanations disputing some UFO incidents that often were not scientifically defendable, especially for a guy like him who is a competent technologist. So it it's, it's strongly suggestive that he had a private agenda of disinformation as part of his job. So at this point it may be useful to highlight, again this is a little tutorial, which I'm going to call the anatomy of secrecy. How do you make something secret within the government or military community? Well, the first thing, you can, def you can define the content of what's going on as secret or top secret or whatever level just is justified by the content of the material. If there's a contract, the content of the work can be classified secret, top secret, what have you. But let's assume you're really serious about making this especially secure. The other thing you can do is called compartmental, uh, compartmentalization. You can compartmentalize the project. And how do you do that? You make the existence of the contract classified. And uh, they, these are uh, usually in the intelligence community, and that's why they're, they go by a nickname. They're called black programs from the intelligence uh, side. Uh, these, are, these are great contracts to get because your competitors don't know they exist. So they're sole source, and uh, they're considered attractive uh, contracts. See, I, I have served as chairman of the board of f four different publicly traded defense contractors. And uh, uh, several of these were uh, companies that d had their primary commitments in deeply classified work and uh, obviously included compartmentalized programs. But I have to tell you, I was startled. At, I spent 30 years in the strategic community, both in the Department of Defense community directly and also, as I say, uh, on boards and, uh, uh, of uh, of publicly traded defense contractors. And I have to tell you, it was, was late in that 30-year career that I discovered, much to my amazement, there is another level of security, and that's where you make the existence of the customer classified. And I was uh, in one of those pro uh, projects, 
And uh, the, the, uh, it was a very, very strange meeting. We had a, uh, uh, our little company that uh, uh, was publicly traded, but not a large company, uh, was competing for a, a particular uh, procurement. And uh, the, the head of that particular division asked me, as chairman of the board and controlling shareholder, and, uh, and uh, uh, so on, to, to, to be present in the meeting, along with our banker. The vice president of uh, First Interstate Bank uh, was there. And uh, as we, in this conference room, uh, three guys come in with business cards and give us their business cards, High Technology Research Associates or something like that, but quickly explain that that's just a cover and we're not surprised. We, that's what's known as a cutout, a, a, a shell corporation that they're using for uh, uh, quite, you know, certain purposes. And, uh, and they explained to us that um, uh, we are, there are two, we're down to two companies, ours, which is a smaller company, and another large company. One of the two companies is going to get, this is like on a Wednesday or Thursday, on Monday, one of these companies will be phoned and get the contract. And we're in the running. Okay, that's exciting. Um, but then they explain that they're very embarrassed because we'll get a verbal okay on Monday if we, if we win. But we'll have to start work right away to make the timing, and they won't be able to get paperwork to us for maybe 60 or 90 days. They're, they're embarrassed, but it, just, it takes that long to get the kind of paperwork we need. And so the problem is we're going to have to start on a verbal go-ahead before we have paper. And the problem with that is, is that they looked at our financials, and we weren't that financially strong to undertake that kind of a commitment. And so that's why they wanted a banker there. And so they said, would, could the bank extend? We, I think we had a credit line in those days of, I think, four and a half million. It would take another million and a half to make us presentable for this purpose. And, uh, and, I, and so they asked the bank if the bank could increase our credit line for a million and a half. And the banker very naturally said, you don't tell us who you are, and you won't tell us what, you know, what it's all about. The answer is no. And so we're at a stalemate, because as instead, we're not, we, we, we wouldn't be qualified. And uh, I turned to the... First, Vice President of First Interstate Bank, I says, you people have my personal financials. In those days I had money. That's before I got in my project with the Russians. But anyway, um, they took me down. But the point is, in those days I had a, a net worth. I says, you, you have a net worth. If I guaranteed the incremental loan, would the bank willing to go along with this? And he said, I can't. He says, he didn't have the authority, but we go downtown. He says, they'd probably go along with that. So I turned to the customer. I says, if I can pull that off in the next 24 hours, would that suffice? And they said, sure. So that's exactly what we did. I went downtown the next morning to First Interstate Bank. We signed some papers, and I guaranteed an additional, an incremental million and a half on the uh, existing four and a half million dollar loan on that Thursday or Friday, whatever it was. And that Monday, we did get a phone call, and we won this contract. And that was eight. It, it, it turned out to be the electronics for the B2, and uh, uh, it was um, 18 months later that that whole project got transferred to Northrop. But prior to that, it was in an in a organization whose existence is classified. And so it, was, it startled me to discover that there's a whole procedure. There are uh, 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 cost uh, rec recovery procedures. There are courts. There's all kinds of all the necessary infrastructure to make this all work is in place. And it's all uh, highly classified to protect even the existence of the customer. It's the third level, if you will. You follow me? Well. One of the things that I want to, when you start talking about this, with that kind of a structure, how do you also really protect something that you're trying to keep secret? And one of the things you can do is have an active disinformation strategy. You not only keep it secret, you publish things to keep people from understanding what it is, discredited or whatever else. And we did that, for example, in the Manhattan Project during World War II. The very existence of our atomic, atomic bomb project, the so-called Manhattan Project, was hidden under a whole bunch of other cover stories and pseudo-projects. You went through certain doors, there were projects going on that really had nothing to do with anything, they were just a cover to hide what was really going on. Active disinformation. And one of the things I personally suspect is that's exactly what they did with MJ-12. It's very possible that they surface documents that have flaws in them, knowing that after a few months, few years, whatever, the diligence of researchers will discover that that couldn't have been that typewriter, that really isn't Truman's signature, whatever. So everybody knows that MJ-12 is just a big hoax. What a perfect cover. Ask anybody that's in this community about MJ-12, and they'll shrug it off right away. Oh, that's that, that hoax that surfaced in the 80s. Really. What a perfect cover. 
And obviously, if, uh, if I, I, I think it's real.